Betty Boop is the sexiest, sultry and seductive animated goddess and icon of the golden age of animation. Debuting at the Fleischer Studio in 1930, she provided a bright spark of light for those in the Depression era, pining for the optimistic days of the Jazz Age. As a cartoon series filled with highly promiscuous material, mainly aimed towards an adult audience, Betty never saw enormous stardom, even at the height of her career. And following the introduction of film censorship regulations in 1934, she saw an even further decline in popularity, with her cartoons suddenly watered down. Relegated to sporadic television appearances in later decades and becoming a merchandising symbol and pin-up icon in the 1980s, Betty has struggled to find her place in the limelight ever since. Regardless, in 2020, Betty Boop turns 90 years old, and to celebrate, I will trace her entire evolution from 1930 to now. To do so, we'll look at her entire history, touching on the changes in her design, personality and stylistic approach, prevalent across a near century of shorts, television specials and extended media. In this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> Throughout the 1910s and 1920s, Max Fleischer and his brother Dave slowly revolutionised the landscape of the animation industry as two of its earliest pioneers in the silent age. Originally producing shorts for the Bray studio, the Fleischers not only pioneered rotoscoping techniques in which live action footage could be traced to paper or cells for more realistic animation, but also established technology in which animation and live action footage could be combined. Their series Out of the Inkwell, amongst the first popular animated series debuted in 1918, starring a live-action Max and their first famous character, Coco the Clown, a rotoscoped animation of Dave in a clown suit. By 1921, the Fleischers had opened their own studio, Out of the Inkwell Incorporated, and at the dawning of the sound era, launched the very first sound-on-film animated series, Song Cartoons, in 1924. Each short was introduced by Coco and featured animation set to music, the lyrics of which were shown on screen with a bouncing ball used to encourage and assist audience participation. This technique, established by the Flashes, is still used in sing-along films and karaoke today. Over the course of the mid to late 1920s, numerous legal complications, failed distributor partnerships and bankruptcies led the Flashes to reform their company as Fleischer Studios in 1929 and enter into a distribution partnership with Paramount Studios, who were looking to bulk up their offering of sound pictures or talkies with cars cartoons, which were faster and less expensive to produce than live action. For Paramount, the Fleischers revived their song cartoon series as Screen Songs, utilising the studio's catalogue of hit music as their soundtrack, with many shorts acting as de facto publicity advertisements for popular artists. Despite their continued use of Coco for more than a decade in Out of the Inkwell, known as Inkwell Imps since 1927, the character never reached any major level of popularity, starring in shorts more or less seen as gimmick or novelty pictures. While feeling Alex the Cat had taken the world by storm in the early 1920s, the emergence of Mickey Mouse in Walt Disney's groundbreaking 1928 synchronised sound cartoon Steamboat Willie showed the world a new kind of cartoon superstardom, leaving studios scrambling for new stars to rival him. The overwhelming popularity of Mickey marked a further decrease in popularity for the still silent Coco, who had been up to the same old antics for a decade. Coco was put into retirement, and the entire Inkwell series along with him, with the Fleischers replacing it with Talker Tunes, a brand new sound series. Upon introduction, Paramount spruiked the series as something entirely new and entirely different from anything ever seen and heard before. To fill the gap left by Coco, in the fourth Talker Tunes, Hot Dog, released in 1929, the Fleischers debuted a brand new character, later known as Bimbo. The character slowly became a regular staple of the Talker Tunes and eventually their short-lived headliner, even if the Fleischers hadn't exactly planned on it initially. As animation historian Michael Barrier put it, at this time, the Fleischers all but ridiculed the idea of continuing characters, calling their cartoons 
poor soil for the strong growth of character. With the Fleischers paying very little attention to continuity or consistency, Bimbo took on a different appearance depending who was animating. He rotated between tall white dog, short white dog, tall black dog with long legs, short black dog with bowed legs, and shorter black dogs with huge round head, before the studio finally conformed with his most recognisable design in 1932. As part of an effort to provide Bimbo with supporting characters, animator Grim Natwick was tasked with developing a female counterpart. Studying art at the Vienna National Academy, Natwick developed incredible skills in realistically drawing and later animating the female form. A skill very few animators had at the time and one which went on to define his career, with animation historian John Canemaker calling him perhaps the finest animator of the female form and character, certainly a pioneer in this special area. Utilising Paramount's vast musical catalogue to drive their shorts, a copy of I Wanna Be Loved By You by popular singer Helen Kane was given to Natwick with the task of setting it to animation and developing a new character for it. This character debuted in 1930s talk cartoon Dizzy Dishes in the form of a canine Shantuzzi, a female lounge singer but in dog form to perfectly suit Bimbo. Creating somewhat of a parody of Kane, Natwick noted he started with her trademark spit curls, a fashion of the day, and went from there. He gave the character long dog ears, a small dog nose, and in Barrier's words, grotesquely exaggerated mouth movements. In juxtaposition to her doggish face, Natwick made the rest of her extremely feminine, giving her a voluptuous body and gracing her with a rather swinging dance, which no dog could have done. Natwick said, at that time there were no designers and no storymen. We virtually wrote our own stories and designed our own characters, then animated them. I'm not even sure she was okay before I animated her. Upon release, audiences were captivated with the character, and over the next year, she, much like Bimbo, morphed multiple times before settling on a conformed model. Her next appearance was in Talkatoon Barnacle Bill, released only two weeks later. Here she appeared slightly skinnier and with no spit curls. The most interesting thing about this short, however, is how quickly the character's sex appeal was ramped up, despite despite still being dog-like. An entire sequence sees her highly promiscuous, attempting to woo Bimbo in a short negligee which leaves very little to the imagination. One shot depicts her with incredibly large cleavage, while another puts her undergarments on full display. The character's unprecedented sexuality would become a dominating factor in her later popularity. Mysterious Mose returned her to her Dizzy Dishes design, but placed her in her first prominent role. In fact, despite this being a bimbo headliner, he first appears three minutes into the short and sees far less screen time than her. While some disagree that Teacher's Pest should be counted, a juvenile cat-like version of the character appears. It's unknown whether this is actually the same character or simply Natwick playing around with the female form, as over in the Screen Song shorts, similar characters appeared multiple times, which could all similarly be considered character prototypes, though not officially recognised. Officially, however, the character's next appearance was in The Bum Bandit, which debuted her more recognisable slender physique. Featuring a thin torso and waist, curvaceous hips, and long willowy legs, slowly morphing into the character we know today. Natwick later called this short the first serious animation he ever did, utilising what Barrier called detailed touches unusual for that period in animation. In fact, it was Natwick's animation on Betty in this short that caught Walt Disney's attention and made him one of the studio mogul's most desired animators for a number of years. The following talk cartoon, Silly Scandals, essentially returned to this same design and reintroduced the character's spit curls. Most notably, the short marked the first time she was referred to as Betty on screen. We want Betty! We want Betty! Many incorrectly assume that the screen song short Betty Coed, released only three months later, is also an early appearance of the name. Though despite that short's Betty being voiced by Mae Crystal, the voice actor then voicing Natwick's Betty, the the two characters are completely different. However, it has been argued that considering both shorts were in production at the same time, the screen song's featured tune could have inspired the name for Natwick's character. Betty's design had now pretty much settled for the
the time being, as seen in the next Hawker Toon, Bimbo's Initiation. The cartoon was perhaps Natwick's most surreal and beloved Flasher short, and was also his final. In mid-1931, he transferred to Abiwerks' studio to work on Flip the Frog, Willy Whopper and Commie Color short, before moving to the Disney studio specifically to animate female characters, after Walt had relentlessly headhunted him for the best part of five years. Besides his pioneering work on Betty Boop, Natwick is perhaps best known for his work on Disney's 1937 feature Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, as the lead character animator of its titular heroine and the studio's first princess. With Natwick gone, animating duties were handled to a number of other studio artists, chief among them Seamus Jimmy Colhane and Al Uxa, who became the studio's Betty specialists in her formative years. With each passing short, Betty's popularity was further eclipsing that of Bimbo's. Her name first appeared on the Talker Tunes title card in Bimbo's Express, presented as a Bimbo and Betty cartoon. However, by the following short, her name took over first billing, with Minding the Baby a Betty Boop and Bimbo cartoon, the first appearance of her full name in any short, of course inspired by the Helen Kane song and her Boop singing style. Minding the Baby was also one of the very last shorts to depict Betty as a dog, though by this time her face had been rendered more and more human. She now sported incredibly feminine facial features, including newly added shiny eyelids and a human nose. The only real dog-like feature that remained were her long floppy ears. However, by the following talker tune, Masquerade, these had morphed into hoop earrings, and Betty Boop was officially a human. Though it is worth noting that the screen song Kitty from Kansas, released a month earlier, featured a fairly human-like Betty, though her ears were covered by a hood, perhaps assisting in the transition from ears to earrings, and thus animal to human. Masquerade was additionally presented as a Betty Boop cartoon, her first official solo headliner, with fine print somewhat denouncing Bimbo as a sideliner. As animation historian Mark Langer pointed out, Bimbo's presence failed to restore the series to the success of the earlier Silent Cocos, and as Betty began to run away with the series, no longer was he destined for stardom. Though Betty had taken her final form, after 10 official shorts and a handful of prototypes, she appeared dog-like one final time, in the following talker toon, Jack and the Beanstalk, released only two weeks later. It's very unlikely that this was the result of a devolution, but more likely a short that was held over from the production line. With Dizzy Red Riding Hood, the final talker toon of 1931, Betty reverted to her human design once and for all, with Bimbo 2 finally conforming to to a single design, though still remaining a dog. The major difference between the early design changes of Betty and Bimbo was that while Bimbo's could be attributed to various animators artistic license, Betty's were out of necessity, a well structured plan to refine and define her as a recurring character. It was clear that the Fleischers were starting to take their characters more seriously and were likewise paying more attention to story. Barrier notes that Betty was their only character of any consequence, and as a result, the studio reintroduced Coco. In in effort to provide Betty with more supporting characters alongside Bimbo. Though Betty was finally given a model sheet to which artists could conform to, minor changes still occasionally slipped through the cracks, notably in 1932's Minnie the Moocher, where she appears a little pudgier. Many of her animators were still not as proficient with the female form as Natwick and continually struggled with her unusual, exaggerated design. Though later said to have been envisioned as a 16-year-old, Betty had an enormous childlike head with large eyes, a button nose and no neck, with a disproportioned, fully formed, mature female body with small chest and torso and curvaceous hips and thighs. Animation historian Leonard Moulton noted, Natwick's colleagues agreed that only he would have had the ability and the confidence to devise a female character with an even remotely realistic body. Hardly anyone else in the studio could animate it. Culhane elaborated, saying, most of the guys didn't get much of a feel for the impossible gracefulness of the character. Despite Betty's ab normal design, Moulton further noted, no matter that she didn't make sense anatomically, she was adorable. 
Betty appeared in 11 tour cartoons and 9 screen songs throughout the first half of 1932, amongst them some of her most memorable and beloved earlier appearances, including the second short of the year, Boop Oop A Doop, which introduced her theme song, Sweet Betty. By the end of that July, Betty had well and truly stolen the show, and the Fleischers decided to rebrand the tour cartoons as Betty Boop Cartoons. No longer was Betty simply a series headliner, she was the series. The first the first official Betty Boop was aptly titled Stopping the Show, and she was soon known as the Queen of the Animated Screen. Betty's peak popularity was reasonably short-lived, lasting only two years. Despite such a short peak, Betty certainly made an enormous splash in the pop culture pool, starring in 36 solo shorts from 1932 to 1934. In this time, Myron Waldman took the reins as key animator, and David Tendler, Roland Crandall and Seymour Knight Tell also made numerous notable contributions. The character that Betty had become drew enormously from the countercultural flapper girls of the Roaring Twenties, free-spirited women who could be found flaunting the rules of society at divey jazz clubs, publicly dressing scantily, dancing erratically, drinking and smoking excessively, and otherwise wildly enjoying the new radical freedoms of post-World War I society. Moulton called Betty the perfect flapper who could flirt and tease but remain pure and innocent, represented in her power paradoxical design, risque escapades, and overall titillating and sexually charged nature. She was garbed in a typical flapper dress, complete with revealing décotage and ever-falling garter, and was given an entire repertoire of racy songs and dances. This was by far the main allure for her cartoons and her as a character. Moulton further noted it was this pure novelty that kept her afloat. In fact, while most cartoons of the day drew a large child audience, the Fleischer's cartoons were mainly aimed at adult viewers, commonly attributed as to why she never quite reached the same level of stardom or longevity as Mickey Mouse. During a pre-code era where film censorship was extremely loose and almost non-existent, it was incredibly common for films to feature overtly explicit subject matter, including sexual themes and innuendo, promiscuity, infidelity, profanity, substance abuse, and even nudity. However, nothing of the sort had been seen in cartoons before, with the Fleischers using Betty as somewhat of a conduit for the audience's darkly rooted desires. Just as strong female characters were a staple of pre-code cinema, Betty was the strongest of animated heroines. Not only was she the first sex symbol of animation, she could likewise be seen as one of the earliest feminist icons. A virginal character so free in unashamedly flaunting her sexuality, but fully aware of her own personal worth. While Betty relished in the attention thrown at her by her many male admirers, there was always a line, standing up for herself whenever it got out of hand. A number of shorts actually saw Betty in the clutches of sexual predators, whom she tenaciously struck back at. These shorts marked the earliest depictions of sexual harassment in animation, tackling the taboo head on. Natwick attributed the instantaneous success of Betty to her being the first real feminine character who introduced new sensitivity to cartoons. As, in Moulton's words, a holdover from the 1920s, Betty not only excited audiences in whole new ways, but for a brief spark in time, also provided an escapism from the dire existence of the Great Depression, returning audiences to the glorious days of the Jazz Age by epitomising the hopes and dreams they so greatly desired. There was one, however, who was not all too thrilled with Betty's success. That was, of course, the woman who had inspired her very existence to begin with, Helen Kane. Known as the Boop Ooper Doop Girl, Kane saw an incredibly successful career throughout the 1920s as a star of songs, stage and screen, starring in seven pictures for Paramount between 1929 and 1931, including the exuberant musical review feature Paramount on Parade. As she found her own fame waning in the early 1930s, Kane was not impressed that Betty had simultaneously risen in popularity with essentially the same shtick. Boop, boop, beep, beep. 
Feeling her limelight had been stolen and her image exploited, in 1932, Kane filed a $250,000 infringement lawsuit, equivalent of about $4.5 million in 2020, against Max Fleischer and Paramount for creating unfair competition with their deliberate caricature. Despite the fact that Betty Boop had quite obviously drawn major influence from Kane's signature performance style, the problem for Kane was the defence was able to prove that it was not even hers to begin with. Esther Jones, a young African-American performer, was the one who laid claim to the style. Jones was an admired staple at Harlem's Cotton Club, a nightclub which regularly featured the most popular black entertainers of the time. Jones, nicknamed Baby Esther, was well known for her baby style of improvisational scat singing, all marked by youthful phrases like boo 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 and do do do. In court, Esther's theatrical manager Lou Bolton claimed that he had met Kane and her booking agent Tony Shane, also Jones' booking agent, at the Everglades Club on Broadway on an evening where Jones performed her signature act. Bolton asserted that Kane soon appropriated Jones' style, incorporating the phrase boop boop a doop into her song I Wanna Be Loved By You, which became a hit mere months later. Bolton also presented a filmed performance of Jones and the court ruled in favour of Paramount and Fleischer. It's fairly unreasonable to believe that the Fleischers or Paramount disregarded the influence of Jones as they were simply parodying a style that was rampantly popular at the time, with other actresses having also adopted it throughout their career, such as Paramount's It Girl of the 1920s, the iconic Clara Bow, a screen siren who starred in almost 60 films between 1922 and 1933, including 1927's Wings, the first ever Academy Award winner for Best Picture. Marilyn Monroe Monroe would later appropriate the style as well, most notably in 1959 classic Some Like It Hot. Whether her influence was direct or indirect, as jazz historian Robert O'Mealy has said, Jones is inarguably the black grandmother of Betty Boo. In fact, the Betty Boop cartoons were quite revolutionary when it came to the advancement of black representation in cinema, with many early shorts devised as promotional pieces for some of the period's most influential black jazz singers. Not only did their songs appear in the films, but they made live action cameos. Notably, Louis Armstrong, Don Redman and Cab Calloway all made appearances, the latter of which appeared in a total of three shorts and later attributed much of his success to Betty. The inclusion of such artists was an incredible incredibly daring move by the Fleischers and Paramount, considering Jim Crow racial segregation laws were still enforced in the US South, meaning such shorts would be banned in all southern states. Against the grain, while other studios were regularly ridiculing the black community, the Fleischers were embracing it. Betty herself even appeared with darker skin in a small number of shorts. Luckily, the Fleischers survived what could have been a major setback with the Kane lawsuit, and Betty was allowed to thrive for a number of years. However, what Betty couldn't survive was the implementation of the Hayes Code. With filmmakers and stars constantly abusing their artistic freedoms, films continued to grow cruder and luder. Paramount, incidentally, happened to be one of the greatest offenders, particularly with their features starring Mae West, the era's greatest sex symbol and critically applauded Bad Girl, whose films were exploding with immense sexuality and now iconic double entendres, challenging and parodying, in her belief, America's prudish attitude towards sex. West had been J for 10 days in 1926 for corrupting the morals of youth with her Broadway play Sex, and in the early 1930s was likewise used as a scapegoat for moral activists rallying against the perverted landscape of cinema. In order to uphold and promote traditional values, a set of regulations were legally imposed on Hollywood in mid-1934, censoring the kinds of content that could be seen in films. The code, known as the Hayes Code, restricted inference of sex perversion, nudity and profanity amongst much else, outlawing all overt or suggestive sexual references or representations. The code, of course, did not just apply to live-action film, but also to animated film, with one theatre owner at the time complaining to Film Daily that the worst kicks we have are on smart in cartoons. They are primarily a kid draw and parents frequently object to the filth that is put in them. The dirtiest ones are invariably the least funny. 
In the words of cane maker Betty Boop, eventually became sexy enough to be banned by Hollywood censors for being too lewd. And almost as if overnight, the once sultry, seductive and sexually suggestive icon became the plainest of Janes. She was covered up with more demure clothing, including longer dress, skirts and pants, and long sleeve shirts and sweaters. Animators also took the opportunity to make her appear more realistic, and despite still presenting her with an odd shaped head, shrunk it down, so it was no longer disproportioned to her body, which incidentally was made longer. Depending on the cartoon, Betty was now depicted as a career girl or a housewife, but one with no romantic partner. With the suggestion of bestiality lingering over the Betty Bimbo relationship, the Fleischer's favourite dog was quickly dropped from the series, and a new love interest named Freddy was introduced in 1934 short She Wronged Him Right. However, after only appearing in five cartoons, Freddy was dropped from the lineup, and a now asexual Betty no longer showed sexual attraction to any character ever again. Censors even demanded the series intro be removed because her wink to camera was deemed to be suggestive of immorality. Now a goody two-shoes, Betty's repertoire of songs was also cleaned up, no longer evocative but squeaky clean. Along with Bimbo, Coco was once again retired, as were many of the series' sleazy and perverted background characters, giving the cartoons an entire overhaul. Two new characters were, however, introduced. Pudgy, Betty's non-anthropomorphic, kid-friendly dog, who debuted in 1934's Betty Boop's Little Pal, and regularly appeared in the cartoons almost until the end. And Grampy, an eccentric innovator and professor, first appearing in 1935's Betty Boop and Grampy. Despite Moulton calling Grampy the best character to emerge from these post-code Betty Boop cartoons, he only appeared in nine total. Sadly, as the decade moved on, Betty's shorts became aimed towards a younger audience and she became more and more innocent and innocuous. Betty fell from favour and her own cast of supports became more popular than her, taking over as leads and pushing her to the sidelines in many of her own cartoons. Additionally, the Fleischer's short-lived headliner was now overshadowed by their newest star, Popeye the Sailor, who most of their effort and attention was now aimed towards and who had ironically made his screen debut in a 1933 Betty Boop short, utilising her then popularity to boost his own. While most of the later Bettys are fairly unnoteworthy, a number of them did boast technological achievements in effort to boost her popularity. 1934's Poor Cinderella, which was incidentally the short which debuted Betty's new design, was produced in colour as the first instalment of the Fleischer's colour classic series. These cartoons aimed to rival Disney's incredibly popular Silly Symphonies, which had made the switch to colour two years prior with the groundbreaking flowers and trees. Disney's colour cartoons were created with the astonishing three-strip Technicolor process, which allowed a full range of vibrant colours. Though as Walt had signed a two-year exclusivity deal for it, the Fleischers could only produce theirs in the inferior two-strip Technicolor and Cinecolor processes, which only allowed access to a somewhat murky and much less vibrant red-green spectrum. Making the best of a bad situation, this encouraged animators to colour Betty's hair red in the short, trying to use the process to its greatest advantage. This was the only time Betty's hair was ever depicted red, and the short was Betty's only classic colour cartoon. Poor Cinderella also made limited use of the Fleischer's setback camera stereoptical process, allowing placement of film cells in and around small three-dimensional models and sets which revolved on a large turntable, providing a sense of depth and forced perspective. The stereoptical process, which actually preceded Disney's much lauded multiplane camera, was additionally used to great effect in numerous other shorts, including Betty Boop and the Little King, House Cleaning Blues, and Betty Boop and Grampy. While technology Logically brilliant, these shorts were not enough to keep Betty in the game, as she continued to dwindle in audience favour and the popularity of Popeye continued to skyrocket. Other efforts to boost Betty's popularity in the mid to late 1930s included numerous attempts to pair her with popular comic strip characters with a hopeful intent to partner her with Popeye in a combined spin-off series, and an endeavour to infuse her shorts with big band tunes and transition her into the swing era, with her jazz age allure having worn off. One final last ditch effort saw Betty given one final redesign at the beginning of 1938. This design saw her cutened and rounded, and once again made even more realistic 
realistic, her head no longer an incredibly odd shape and given a more modern hairdo. Notably, this design saw the return of her garter and she was given a more shapely hourglass figure, perhaps thanks to an incredibly slight loosening of the motion picture code in the lead up to World War II. Strangely though, Betty was stripped of all her jewellery, including her trademark hoop earrings, except, as her model sheet read, on special jobs. Though none of these undertakings were of any avail, the Fleischers managed to sustain Betty's series, continually producing 12 shorts a year, until 1939 when production slowed and releases became more sporadic, with only 6 released. In contrast, 15 Popeye shorts were pumped out the following year. By August 1939, the Betty Boop series had well and truly run its course, officially ending with Yip Yip Yippy, a one-shot short which didn't even star Betty at all. Her final theatrical appearance was actually the previous short, Rhythm on the Reservation. Betty Boop had an incredibly good run and managed to last long past her expiry. She starred in a total of 89 solo shorts between 1932 and 1939 and close to 130 shorts total including talker tunes and screen songs since 1930. Though she never reached the same level of stardom as Mickey Mouse, it's worth noting that in this same period, Mickey only appeared in a total of 95 cartoons. The Fleischers continued pumping out Popeye shorts as well as various other unsuccessful series, though budgetary and box office issues pertaining to the feature length releases, Gulliver's Travels and Mr. Bug Goes to Town, as well as their highly ambitious Superman cartoon, saw the brothers $600,000 in debt, equivalent to almost $11 million in 2020. As a result, their personal and professional relationship broke down and forced a division at the studio. With the brothers failing to pay off the debt, Paramount led a hostile takeover of the now bankrupt Fleischer Studio, rechristened it Famous Studios, and forcing them both to resign, continued the various productions without them. Betty Boop thenceforth disappeared into relative obscurity, only re-emerging in 1955 when National Telefilm Associates, or NTA, bought the television syndication rights to her cartoons, which became a staple of mid to late 1950s cartoon programming. However, with more appealing and exciting cartoons appearing in the 1960s in colour, the Betty Boop shorts were eventually retired from the airwaves. Betty, however, found herself a symbol of yet another counterculture that arose in the 1960s. 60s and 1970s, which much like the flapper culture of the 1920s, challenged the current establishment and helped lead to a less conservative, freer society. This adoption saw Betty appearing on a number of television commercials and made way for the release of 1974 package feature The Betty Boop Scandals of 1974, which bundled a selection of her most popular Fleischer shorts, and its subsequent vinyl LP, which became a defining soundtrack of the movement, with songs that had become relevant once again. In attempt to capitalise on her newfound popularity, NTA planned to re-syndicate the Betty shorts on television, but fearing the black and white cartoons were still out of favour, sent a selection of them to South Korea to be retraced and colourised. The result was an incredibly slapdash reproduction which tarnished the original artwork. No network wanted to buy them up and they were instead parcelled out to record producer Dan Dalton, who spliced up scenes from 35 cartoons and tied them together with new narration to form a loose theatrical narrative, originally intended to tie in with the 1976 presidential campaign under the title Betty Boop for President, the film was delayed by the distributor and eventually only received a television release in 1981 under the title Hooray for Betty Boop. The 1980s saw Betty adopted by merchandisers who found huge marketing potential in her face and brand following her newfound resurgence. In their hands, Betty became larger than ever as a beloved pin-up icon, featured on clothing, accessories, statues and figures for close to two decades. Betty became so synonymous with merchandise in fact that many consumers were unaware that she was even a star of films but simply a brand creation akin to Hello Kitty. Betty did however appear in a 1980s television special titled The Romance of Betty Boop, directed by Bill Melendez, best known for producing the Charlie Brown and Peanuts television specials since 1965. Though set during the Great Depression, Betty appeared in a more modern, relevant design, with Melendez calling it For Today. The aim was to spawn an entire series of Melendez Betty Boop specials, though poor ratings disallowed these plans from ever eventuating. A second, unrelated special, Betty Boop's Hollywood mystery movie, did 
however, eventuate in 1989, directed by George Evelyn. The short was produced in a more modern style, though the character once again took on her classic promiscuous 1930s design. The short also saw the re-emergence of both Bimbo and Coco. Prior to this, Betty also made a bittersweet cameo in Disney's 1988 live-action animation hybrid film, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Here she appeared as a 1940s cocktail waitress pining for her days of past superstardom, even saying, Life's been kind of slow since cartoons went to colour. Throughout the 80s, Betty continued to appear in TV commercials and saw a revival in comics, starring in a short-lived newspaper strip alongside Felix the Cat between 1984 and 1988, produced by the King Feature Syndicate. However, Roger Rabbit was sadly Betty's final ever theatrical appearance. Despite this, a number of productions have been attempted over the years. In 1993, producers Richard D. Zanuck, Alan Ladd Jr. and Richard Fleischer, son of Max, were prepping Betty's musical feature film debut for MGM, penned by Jerry Rees and directed by Steve Moore. Fleischer noted in interviews at the time that it would be a comedy with a good love story, and that Betty would be sexy, sassy and innocent all at the same time. Ladd added, while our Betty will remain in the 30s, she will have a decidedly modern twist. Broadway icon Bernadette Peters, who had previously portrayed Betty in a 1981 Saturday Night Live sketch and had been considered for a proposed 1980s Betty Boot Broadway show, was allegedly set to provide Betty's voice. While the film was in production for a number of months, aiming for a 1994 release, an executive changeover at the studio saw the film cancelled. Only minimal storyboards and concept art have been released publicly. Speaking of Broadway shows, over the years a number of other different Productions have been announced or rumoured by Playbill magazine, though none have ever eventuated. However, in late 2019, composer David Foster released a recording of Something to Shout About, performed by Catherine McPhee, which would have appeared in his planned Betty Boop show. In 2014, Variety reported that Simon Cowell's Psycho Entertainment, along with Fleischer Studios, were planning a Betty Boop film to be animated by Animal Logic, the Australian based animation and VFX studio behind the Lego Movie, Peter Rabbit and Happy Feet. Variety described the film as a music-driven hybrid animated comedy, and Cowell noted, Betty is an icon and one of the biggest stars in the world. I'm thrilled to be working with her. Despite additionally sharing his enthusiasm for the film on Twitter, no further updates were ever made, with the film likely cancelled. Similarly, a 26-episode television series was announced by Deadline in 2006 and was set to be produced by Fleischer Studios and King features and animated by Normal Animation, the studio behind the 2014 Peanuts revival series. Deadline described the series as aimed at tweens and teens, noting that it would recount the daily struggles, joys and victories of young Betty Boop, who has every intention of being on stage and becoming a superstar. Originally planned to debut in 2019 or 2020, no further announcements have been made on the project. In extended media, Betty appeared in 1990 first comics graphic novel Betty's Big Break by Joshua Quagmire, Milton Knight and Leslie Carbaga, and the short-lived 2016 Dynamite Entertainment Betty Boop comic series, which paired her once again with Bimbo and Coco, but was sadly cancelled after only four issues. While Betty has not appeared in any new film, series or specials for close to 30 years, her longevity as a pop culture icon has seen her appear in a number of television commercials, including one in 2010 for Dan E. Nutritional supplements, a 2012 ad for Lancome's Hypno Star Mascara Lash Tool, where she starred alongside model Daria Werbewey, and a 2017 digital short series titled Betty Goes Opposin, designed to promote Max Betty Boop red lipstick and a range of Betty Boop inspired dresses by fashion designer Zach Posen, who too appeared in the shorts. These small commercials were produced by King Features and returned Betty to her classic 1930s design in animation inspired by the classic Fleischer shorts. Also notable is the appearance of Pudgy. This period has also seen her featured heavily on casino slot machines and strategic computer video games, some of which she's even appeared in in a computer animated 3D design, including the likes of 2012's Betty Boop's Love Meter, 2014's Betty Boop Dance Card, also known as Betty Boop's Bop, and 2015's Betty Boop's Firehouse. Betty currently has her own 
store at Universal's Islands of Adventure in Orlando, Florida, and can be found as a performing and roaming meet and greet character at numerous Universal theme parks worldwide. She additionally has her own themed diner, which opened in Japan in 2017. Despite this, Betty continues to exist mostly as a merchandising figure, though one that is not as highly in demand as she once was, with her brand now somewhat stale and many still unaware of her as a star of the golden age of animation. Betty's story is perhaps the saddest of all the figures who have found themselves in cartoon purgatory. Hers is a classic Hollywood tragedy. A starlet taken for granted by those around her, never taken as seriously as she so deserved, and never finding the enormous stardom she was always destined for, despite many fits and starts, deemed outdated in a rapidly evolving landscape. Betty is the premier female icon of animation, and I believe there's still plenty of life left in her. 90 years on, Betty keeps up the good fight, continually standing against the odds, embracing her very being and waiting for the next moment that her star will finally be allowed to shine, brighter than ever before. And at that, it's over to you. I want to know what is your favourite Betty Boop appearance and how would you like to see her make a comeback in the near future, if at all? Fire away in the comments below and let me know your thoughts. If this is your first time viewing one of my videos and you'd like to see more like it in the future, then please don't forget to hit that big old subscribe button up on your screen, as well as that like button down below for that little extra support. Also, don't forget to check me out on social media, and please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and have a fantastic day.